Hey, what's going on? This is the Saturday Down South podcast. I am Connor Gira. Well, you got back to Louisiana for a little bit for for Easter. How was yep. how was the holiday weekend for you? Man, it was electric. Got to do the tradition of the Good Friday Cajun camp. You know what Ooh. I'm saying? Um, my poor stepdad got stranded in the Atlanta airport after I had left the Atlanta airport because he was flying to New Orleans. I was flying to Baton Rouge. That was kind of funny. I was like, "See you tomorrow, buddy." Uh, the same airport, but uh, yeah, it was it was a, it was a very very fun time. You know, I got to be around my family, which was awesome. Got to reconnect to my roots. Got to watch the Lady Tigers win on the television. I got to go catch the Pelicans get smacked by the Celtics, but I got great. Uh, tickets surrounded by some Celtics fans. I found out that catch as soon as I showed up, but I had an amazing, amazing time. Got to be with John, got to be with my family. Couldn't ask for a better Easter weekend. How'd you eat? Oh man, it was Louisiana. I mean, it was, it was everything. <laughs> we had a nice dude. If there's the thing, you know, it's, there's the two places you find the best food in Louisiana are gas stations in Cajun country and fine dining in New Orleans. We got to hit both of those. You know, we got us, got us some off the road, you know, Boudreaux type places. And then our brunch, I picked out our brunch on Easter and it was like seven courses. It was really nice. It was not, you know, not too bad price wise. It was amazing. I was like, look guys, you know, that's, that's the balance of Louisiana, you know? Easter is an underrated food holiday. It Mm -hmm. really is. Everybody always talks about Thanksgiving, even though Thanksgiving is a holiday wherein we have a food that we pretty much eat one day of the year, foods that we only eat one day of the year. Whereas like Easter, there's, more flexibility to it. Like when I was a kid growing up, we used to have lamb that was delicious that my uncle Brad made that, you know, that when you're in like fifth and sixth grade and you are just like over the moon about a specific food, like a, mm-hmm. a meat like that, that's a little bit more of an acquired taste, you know, it must be really good. And it, man, it was unbelievable. Um, but yeah, the, the food that, that one consumes on Easter uh, is uh, to me, very, very underrated. I have now begun the tradition of an Easter quiche this third consecutive year of Love making that. an Easter quiche, a little red pepper, a little sausage. You talk about electric, uh, Easter quiche, very much electric. Um, quiche is embarrassingly it. high on my favorite foods. Like it's like top three. Like it, I would rather have a quiche than most. It's got some egg. It's got some carb. It's technically not that bad for you. It's kind of a frittata in that way. So it's, it's perfect to me. I'm a, I'm a big quiche guy. I need, mm-hmm. I need to start having more quiche and it gets a bad rap. I think cause of the name and because, it's mostly served in bougie settings like brunch and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, look, it's it's just good. Once you actually sit down and look at all the ingredients that, that go into it, it's kind of weird too. You're like, oh, I'm putting wild rice and cream of mushroom soup into this thing with eggs, but it just somehow works. That's mm-hmm. that's the beauty of quiche. Um, we will not talk about a bunch of quiche today, although I'm very tempted to. We have a great show lined up. Michael Katz, he's going to join us in a bit, talk about some Ole Miss offseason storylines. We've got Lad of the week, we've got our first, well, second, second Jersey story that we are uh, doing. But first, before we get to all that, uh, the big headline, obviously, in the sports world, uh, the Final Four, obviously. Um, it's an interesting subject as it relates to Alabama punching its ticket to the Final Four for the very first time in school history. I Look, um, I said many times, this is a football podcast, we're going to get, we're going to stick to football. But what Nate Oates just did to get this specific Alabama team to the Final Four, it just Mm -hmm. kind of has me wanting to revisit what I think is one of the most interesting big picture concepts in big revenue college athletics currently. This concept of sustaining basketball success at a football school. Alabama getting to the Final Four in the same year that it earned a playoff berth, historic. Oklahoma did that with Lon Kruger, uh, 2015, 2016, but that's the entire list of schools that made the college football playoff and the men's basketball final four in the same school year. And I'm like, well, I actually forgot about that Oklahoma school year because that was the Trey young one, right? No, that is see that, that exactly. It was buddy healed that Tr- oh, Trey young was oh. after. I think the story is still the same though. That was one where they got smacked by Nova, right? Exactly. They got destroyed yep. by Nova and Oklahoma got destroyed by Clemson in the playoff. And I think that's why I kind of blacked it yep. out is because both those teams were kind of like, uh, yeah, they got there, but did they really they appeared? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, they took a look over there. Um, and it's just, it's not the first thing that comes to mind when you think of a great men's basketball football school year, because obviously the standard for that is 06, 07 Florida. Like it is untouchable. Gators mm-hmm. are still the only school that won both outright, key distinction there, outright in the same year with basketball on the men's side and then football. 
Florida is an interesting place to start this discussion because I think there are a lot of similarities between Billy Donovan and Nate Oates, both of whom have had this kind of meteoric rise at jobs that they took knowing that they were going to be second fiddle to football. When Billy Donovan took the Florida job, he replaced, ironically enough, the aforementioned Lon Kruger, who left mm -hmm. Florida in the mid-90s for Illinois because if you go back and I mean, a lot of Florida fans will probably remember this, but it's very easy to forget. The height of Spurrier's Gators still very much made Florida a football school. Yep. And Lon Kruger wanted to go to a place where basketball was priority number one, and that was Illinois. Uh, I've brought this up before, so excuse me for repeating this, but it's relevant to context for this discussion nearly three decades later. Lon Kruger was two years removed from a Final Four berth at Florida. And even though it was like a, a really bad year that he left after 95, 96, where they just missed the tournament altogether, they were kind of a disaster. He was still considered to be in good standing in 95, 96, but mm -hmm. made that decision. Okay, I'm going to leave Florida. I'm going to go to Illinois. He was never really shy about his frustration. He felt for the lack of fan support for Florida hoops. Like they weren't even selling out during that final four run, they went undefeated that season at home and they like weren't even selling out a 12,000 seat arena. And there mm -hmm. are a lot That's of That's always had. Yeah. I, I, I always feel so bad for that. Like the school that, that just doesn't appreciate it yet. Like, you yep. know that they eventually will, but it, it's, it's hard sometimes. Like sometimes it's just not that overnight thing. I'm not even hating on Florida fans for that, but that's just sometimes the, the dynamic that goes into it. But in that bad year that he had that last season at Florida, average attendance dropped nearly 2000 fans per game. Even when Florida had the final four year, two years earlier with a team that never lost at home. Like imagine just having less than 10,000 fans per home game. I mean, that is, that is a really, really tough pill to, to have to swallow. And obviously that was something that, that he took with him to Illinois and Illinois wasn't even particularly good at the time, but they had a 16,450 seat arena that averaged about 15,000 fans per home game in that season. When they, again, were ninth in an 11 team, big 10. Uh, so that kind of speaks to, to where those, at least where it Back felt when like the big 10 was 10 teams. Wait, you said 11. 11. Yeah. <laughs> Almost uh, 10 teams. <laughs> yeah. The Penn state thing in the mid nineties. Look, if the Big Ten wasn't going to change it then, they weren't going to change it when Nebraska joined and Maryland and Rutgers. Yeah. Like, ah, screw it, whatever. We've been this way for a long time. So uh, it, it is uh, something that I think is just – it doesn't go away because egos don't go away. Right. It is tough to be second at your own school, especially when you're good and you feel like it's that much tougher to endure when you're not good. Mm -hmm. Okay, NATO's can reach the Final Four every year from – now through the rest of the decade, as far as I'm concerned, he could win multiple national titles and Bama would still care more about football. Bama would still be a football school. Okay. Mm -hmm. that, that is an unpopular opinion to have right now, but it is reality. I know that that's the case because if both teams are just as good as one another, what's going to have more fan interest. And it's different because of the capacity of football games, the infrequency of them. But I'm talking about like the midweek reaction and the way that the, the sport is discussed and the way that it is scrutinized. Football is winning that discussion every single time at Alabama. And it's going to take probably decades for that sort of dynamic to ever change. And maybe not even then because, oh my gosh, the Nick Saban era is going to endure for a really long time. What Nate Oates has done in five years is nothing short of remarkable. It really, really is. It's why he's gotten multiple extensions because he does truly feel like this embodiment of the golden era of Bama hoops. Here's the list of schools that have advanced to the Sweet 16 at least three times during the 2020s decade. So we're only talking about four NCAA tournaments, obviously, because 2020 the tournament was canceled. So here are these six schools that have reached the Sweet 16 three times in the 2020s. Arkansas, Alabama, Creighton, UCLA, Houston, Gonzaga. That's it. Six schools, two of which don't have football. UCLA just watched its football coach leave for a coordinator job. Houston yeah. and Arkansas just won four games. One of these things is not like the oh. other. <laughs> Man, okay, so wait, quick thought though. I mean, what's our, is Arkansas a football school? Because they have a more recent basketball national title. Right. But I just stepped on your point, didn't I? I'm sorry. No, you didn't. You didn't. No, not at all. Um, Arkansas is tricky because 
it kind of speaks a little bit to this dynamic that that Houston had as well, where I do think, you know, a Nolan Richardson, you know, 40 minutes of hell team would suggest, okay, the basketball identity is still going to be stronger than football. Arkansas is a lot more balanced than a lot of SEC schools with that support, with that, dyna that dynamic, the, the proverbial everything school. They pride themselves on being when they are at their best. Obviously, baseball is killing it right now as well and track and all those different things. <laughs> But yeah, <laughs> the the weird thing about Arkansas is as much as you would say that you go a quarter century without getting to the second weekend of the NCAA tournament. And yeah. that pushes back on this notion that you are a basketball school with such a high basketball floor. Great basketball tradition that if you're old enough, if you're about my age or a little bit older, you remember the great years of Arkansas basketball pre must mm -hmm. But then obviously you, you go, you know, a couple of decades like that and it and it changes that dynamic so that's that's a very open-ended way to answer that question but it's i think a fair one to ask if that makes sense arkansas is so unique because like if you just google like total sec championships because like track and field count arkansas is like at or near the top and it's like wait arkansas is like great like, incredible at track and field at baseball like you said they're a wagon right now basketball they've had all this stuff like football has had some really high highs they've had some really low lows it, but it's weird because you could argue that football is among their least successful sports because the others are so successful it's not that they're bums or anything but it's like how many sugar bowls or, or, or how many new year six bowls do you have versus how many lead eight sweet 16 track and field championships baseball you know it's like huh so it just that, that's just it. giving arkansas some props for a second because we can't since it's a football podcast we've talked about a lot of their struggles but wow they're doing some great things athletically just kind of like over our lives yeah, there, there are certain schools in the SEC where it feels like if if one specific program is down, then mm -hmm. it's kind of like then then what's really going on here? It's it's a downtime probably in terms of yep. you know campus athletics. That's the way it's perceived nationally. I'm not saying it's like that internally. Whereas Arkansas is one of those schools where yeah, as much as a, a fall Saturday in Fayetteville when things are good, it, you know the vibes probably are about as good as one can ask for. Like go back to 2021, obviously, but the. The, the difference between Arkansas and those other schools is I think, you know, the, the, the floor of those other programs is much higher. So different dynamic. Yeah. So Bama has always felt different. It, it, it just has the way that things have played out in the 2020s for Bama is still suggesting that football is very much at the forefront of this conversation. Three playoff appearances, three SEC titles, obviously a national championship during the 2020s. That is way, way different than those schools that we just brought up that have the three sweet 16 trips in the 2020s decade. Sustaining basketball success while football is at its best is extremely rare. That's an important distinction. It's why a place like Auburn can talk about all the change to a basketball focused school, what it's become a basketball focused school in many ways, but you're like, mm, you're coming off three consecutive losing seasons in football. And the season before that you paid the largest buyout ever in the history of college football, the fire head coach. So yes, the basketball support has significantly increased and that atmosphere looks awesome. But at the same time, how much of that is because, well, football isn't necessarily doing what it's currently doing. And so mm -hmm. we now are saying Auburn basketball school, that's just the way that it is. And with all due respect to Auburn, who have fans that get way more crap than they deserve and more crap should probably be directed at the people behind the scenes than the actual fans themselves. It's not a football blue blood. We're talking about football blue bloods. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of gray area in what makes a football blue blood because you can argue that schools lacking 21st century relevance, like Nebraska, Miami, they shouldn't qualify, but that a more modern blue blood like Clemson and what it was in the 2010s, that they should qualify as a football blue blood. It is very much in the eye of the beholder. But I think the way that I would describe it is this. Football schools have a much bigger national reputation than their basketball counterparts. And they're going to have an elite atmosphere in their football stadium, even in non peak years. So yep. I wouldn't really put Miami in that, you know, that, that category. Okay. We're not yep. But like Oklahoma football school, Georgia football school, Ohio state football school, Nebraska Miami tax fraud school. <laughs> Devin Shapiro people show up school. to their basketball games. That's the question. <laughs> Because I know what they're doing in football. <laughs> they ain't there, man. They ain't there. I don't want to look up those prices on StubHub, but they're they're depressing. They really are. Yeah. Penn, Penn State, football school. Clemson, football school. LSU, football school. Alabama, football school. Right? You yeah. don't push back on any of those, correct? Mm -hmm. 
No, so, and then LSU is such an, not to talk about my team, but LSU is such an interesting example of this because they're arguably the best, uh, at least modern baseball brand. They're like kind of like the like modern, like what Alabama has been for baseball. Like we talk about the 90s, whatever, but still football is what put, put, puts buses in seats. You go to Alex Box, and there's a big drop between Alex Box and like to me the second best baseball environment. But the amount of relevance that baseball has around the country just means that there's still going to be six more times that people in Tiger Stadium. I'm so bad at math. It's not six, but let's call it three or four. <laughs> that was, uh, yeah, look, I, I think that was, no, six was, you're closer with six. Right? Okay. Yeah, we're talking like 20,000 times six is 120,000. Yeah. Actually, yeah, that's exactly the math. Yeah, it's closer to 120 than it is like, eight. yeah. Yeah, Tiger Stadium with like, with 50,000 people would be depressing. That would be yeah. the 2020 season, essentially. All right, um, okay. Yeah, we don't need to go back there. Here's the thing. You cannot be both a football and basketball blue blood, at least not at the same time. No list of basketball blue bloods includes a football school. Kansas, Duke, UNC, Kentucky, UConn, UCLA. And I honestly, like, I'll, I'll, I, I will admit this, even as an Indiana grad, I do not like including Indiana as a basketball blue blood because my school has exactly one Elite Eight trip in my memory on earth. And I'm about to turn 34 years old. And I'd actually rather have a team like Michigan State in there as more of a blue blood, just because if we're talking about success over the last three decades. It's not even close. There is no Venn diagram with basketball blue bloods and football blue bloods. That's not to say that there haven't been good seasons and good stretch mm-hmm. runs. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I I I was going to make an Indiana joke earlier, but I feel like I was already being too mean. I'm glad you covered that. But look, they were a football school and they hired the greatest coaching staff of all time. So they had to switch. They sacrificed basketball. I actually, funny enough, again, us being like on the same page, I was thinking of just Michigan, like UM. But State, yeah, with Izzo, I mean, yeah, again, one title, right? But still like every year competitive, every year, Sweet 16, da, da, da. Michigan's a little bit interesting because I, I don't know if it started with no because they won the title before the Fab Five, but that's still not blue blood, I guess. So yeah, no good good point. I think those are the three that are like football schools that have amazing basketball, but they're not quite right there because it's not a hundred years of it, you know. I got a couple of things on, on Michigan. I, I'm going to get to in a second here because it is. You're right. You're, if there's mm-hmm. one that's kind of close that would hover between those two, Michigan would kind of be it. But mm-hmm. there's something that is it, it, there's an important distinction separating it from that, but. Truly sustaining, top of the sport, concurrent success in those two, Mm -hmm. basketball on the men's side and football, your two biggest revenue drivers. It is so unbelievably rare. It's why we celebrate schools like Florida and Michigan State when they can do it in the 21st century. For a second, it looked like Ohio State was going to do it for two decades, but it was more like a seven to eight year period. Five Mm -hmm. sweet 16s in an eight year stretch with a couple of final four bursts. That is the golden era of Ohio State basketball for anyone that isn't like an older baby boomer that remembers Bobby Knight being a role player on those 1960s Ohio State teams. If you Mm -hmm. don't remember that, that is your golden era of Ohio State hoops. Before that stretch in the late 2000s and early 2010s with Thad Mata, five Sweet 16 trips in the previous 35 years. Ohio State is not a basketball blue blood. They're not. Mm -hmm. They are a football school. Florida's golden era of hoops was 2005 to 2014. Six trips to the Elite Eight. Even a school like Kansas, best such decade of Elite Eight trips, six from 2002 to 2011, right? Mm -hmm. That is pretty good. Speaking of Kansas, it's part of where this modern discussion comes into play and why there are more factors that work against a football school trying to live the basketball dream. If you follow the comments from Hunter Dickinson after he left Michigan for Kansas, you probably know where I'm going with this. Mm-hmm. All American was a three year starter. Uh, he hit the portal. And yeah, like, of course, like the guy gets taken care of from an NIL standpoint, all that stuff. Of course, he's got the Kim Kardashian deal. That How weird was that tweet? My God. You want to talk about <laughs> things that made me like refresh, like this? Wait, what? Kim Kardashian is tweeting about Hunter Dickinson and Caleb yep. Love? Like, what? Uh, What a time to be alive. Uh, Really is. He was not shy about wanting to play at a place where basketball was king. I have never been to Allen Fieldhouse, but I have been to a top 25 game at the Chrysler Center at Michigan with 12,000 people there. And let's just say that I'm not going to push back on Hunter Dickinson when he says that playing at Kansas is a much different experience than playing at Michigan. Okay. Mm -hmm. It just is. That's not to say that 
they don't show out when things are rolling. Like you go back and you, uh, if you've watched Fab Five games, clips, whatever, you've seen the 30 for 30 on like five slam and jamma at Houston. You see incredible atmospheres because they were the best show in sports. But sustaining that success at places where football is still king is really tough. Like, We don't talk about how once Houston lost Drexler and Olajuwon, they didn't win another NCAA tournament game until until 2018. I mean, that's that's a good stat. Yeah, that's crazy. People at Houston know that, and it was still like if you watch Fly Fly Slam and Jamma, they're like, yeah, you know, I think eventually we're going to win another NCAA tournament game. That was before Kelvin Sampson came in and did what he did. But you know, football schools can have special groups of basketball teams. But there are just so many landmines that can get in the way of living the basketball dream at a football school. You can have a successful coach like Lon Kruger. That's like, eh, I'd rather go somewhere that lives and breathes and dies basketball. There's great irony in the comparison of Illinois hoops and Florida hoops for that like 20 year stretch from 1996 to 2016 under Billy Donovan. And it killed, I mean, killed Illinois fans to this day that Bill Self would ever leave Illinois, a basketball school, to go to mm-hmm. a place with even more basketball tradition like Kansas because he was like, you know what? You guys love hoops, but Kansas, that's a different level. And you know what? He was right. He was. It would kill Alabama fans if Nate Oates ever left for a school with greater basketball tradition than Alabama. The good mm-hmm. news, obviously, he's been taken care of. Greg Byrne made him one of the five highest paid basketball coaches in the country with the awkward timing of that, with the one and done at the SEC tournament, all that stuff. My, how things have changed in two weeks. Yep. It, it will not be money that dictates Oates' future in college basketball or really just basketball as a whole. But the elephant in the room, pun intended, is the future of Coleman Coliseum. That's the big thing, right? Mm-hmm. The last major renovation came in 2005 and it shows. That's a long, long time in this era of the big revenue arms race to go without a major renovation. And Cal Perry's over here crying that he doesn't have a practice facility that he approves of, even though Rupp Arena just went this massive, like huge renovation that makes even one of the premier venues in the sport like that much better. It's probably yeah. difficult to think about all the love that Bryant Denny and those insane football facility upgrades continue to be uh, like, and, and think about, you know, what the basketball program is up against with Coleman. And I want to is- say this real quick, because you mentioned, I remember whatever we talked about Stoops, I said, the best thing Stoops has going for him, one of the reasons he's still at Kentucky is John Calipari, because who's mad at Stoops right now? Nobody. <laughs> And so that's like, that was my point. I was like, well, people are mad at Stoops now, but just wait till Calipari screws this next one up. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the dynamic of a fan, a fan approval for those two coaches at Kentucky is just so wildly different right now. It's, it's crazy how much things have changed over the last six, seven years with that. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, as it relates to Bama and this, this, this big elephant in the room, Greg Byrne told AL.com in, in 2021, that, quote, the worst thing we can do is not capitalize on momentum. And that was related to the potential Coleman Coliseum renovation. The problem with why a new arena hasn't been built is that construction costs have obviously soared, which is not what fans want to hear, but it's reality. Greg Byrne told AL.com this summer, this past summer, that the costs for a new arena have gone up about $100 million. I mean, that is a lot of money. That's not money that you can just snap your fingers and get, especially when we know how much it takes from the private sector for Alabama football to exist like Alabama football in the NIL era. Even in a place that's been basically printing money on the football side, truly capitalizing on this Alabama momentum on the basketball side is tricky because if you could renovate Coleman, would you want to do that or would you still want to spend a ton of money to just build a new stadium? It's not a quick fix. And if you're going to sink all this money and eventually want a new stadium 10 years from now, then what's the point of of spending tens of millions of dollars on that renovation? That Rupp renovation, by the way, um, it was estimated to cost $241 million, I think was the original projection, like 2018. Well, I think it ended up costing like $310 million was what I saw. I mean, crazy money. Crazy and then, and like money. I said, and like I said, okay, Stoops contract. Not as scary now. <laughs> Not as scary. Say, look at Kyle Perry's buyout, and then look at Stoops' contract. Not as scary. <laughs> Just going to be worse. honest. 
Life could always be worse, man. Yep. I, I, I bring that up because sometimes that type of stuff can be the difference between keeping an excellent coach or watching him leave for greener pastures. So mm-hmm. far, I think Nate Oates has been really, really loyal to, to, to Alabama from that standpoint. Perhaps of equal importance is that so far he's had no problem with how big the football brand is. Instead of getting upset that he doesn't have like just a lineup full of, you know, five star Brandon Miller, future, you know, number two overall pick type guys, he goes out, he uses the portal and replaces basically, I mean, the vast majority of that roster, what many people felt was was the best Alabama team ever. And he's like, oh, yeah, I got to bring in nine new players. He didn't use his excuse that he lost three assistants and four support staff members. He got to work. He found the right pieces. And after months and months of preaching about the need for his team to actually click in defensively, it's been able to do that in the NCAA tournament. And that's why it's in the Final Four. Will that be enough to beat UConn? I wouldn't bet on it because I'm not a crazy person. Betting against UConn feels like just lighting money on fire at this point. It's possible right now that this is the furthest that Nate Oates will get at Alabama because obviously this tournament is brutal and getting here is so freaking hard. Tom Izzo, widely considered one of the best coaches in the sport because of how great he is in March specifically. And he has exactly one title that happened a quarter century ago. Mm -hmm. But unlike football, Alabama's basketball dream won't be defined by titles. That's a key difference. It'll be defined by whether Oates can do something that's never been done at Alabama before making the tide a yearly contender with final four upside. That's the goal. And that's the possibility. It's easier said than done, even for the basketball blue bloods of the world. But in three out of the last four seasons, I'd actually argue that he's done that because the 23 team, obviously final four upside number one, overall seed in the NCAA tournament 21 team, another team that like 23, they swept the SEC regular season and the tournament titles. And this team, which was believed to have probably the least amount of upside of maybe the last uh, four teams that he's had, uh, they have all this roster turnover and they still end up being the one that finally breaks through. This is not supposed to be the type of team that breaks through at a football school. The weird thing is that it's also not really a Cinderella run. Like That's what NC State, lad of the decade, DJ Burns, that's what they have going on right now. You want to talk about Cinderella? Yep. That is That is Cinderella. There are a lot of reasons why Bama is in this position that are very specific to this situation. I don't mean to broaden this out too much, but the reason specific to this situation, Mark Sears, his development, obviously huge. Grant Nelson having a March game for the ages that we'll be talking about for decades. Nick Pringle turning into basketball Will Anderson down the stretch against Clemson. The addition of Aaron Estrada to give Oates a squad that extremely rare, crafty mid-range shot maker that he desperately needed, that he lacked from that team last year. The Mudita phrase that Patrick Murphy introduced from the Alabama softball team. All of those things are part of this and why this team has gotten to this point. But at the center of all of it, it's Nate Oates. It's the guy with the unique background, the math teacher, the unique offensive system, the unique approach to a job that plenty of people thought had a very defined ceiling. Maybe that defined ceiling is still there and we're seeing it right now. Maybe Oates is going to have a couple of round of 32 exits. Maybe we see the Coleman Coliseum plans continue to drag out, which changes that relationship with Byrne. Maybe Oates grows bitter about that. Stuff like that happens. It could happen again. Or maybe it's possible that Oates can continue to live out this basketball dream at Alabama on a post Nick Saban world. To be clear, one last thing on this. I don't think the football program has to start suffering a decline in fan interest or attendance for Alabama basketball to continue to be what it has been in the 2020s. But I do think this is extremely rare for anyone to pull off at a football school that is maintaining a high level of football success. Even when John Beeline is doing his thing at Michigan, the football program was in the toilet during all Mm -hmm. that stuff. And so it's very, very different to do that when there hasn't been this drastic fall off. I guess if you consider not winning a national championship over a three year stretch, a drastic fall off for Alabama standards, then sure. But still, the success in the 2020s by getting the playoff would suggest that's not the case. I went back and found the schools with both a four team playoff berth and a final four berth during this 10 year window. So we're talking mm-hmm. since the start of the 2014 15 school year. Alabama had eight playoff berths and one Final Four. Oklahoma had five playoff berths, one Final Four. 
Michigan, three playoff berths, one final four. Oregon, one playoff berth, one final four. People forget mm-hmm. about that. Michigan State, one playoff berth, two final fours. Not a single school in America had multiple final fours and multiple playoff berths during that 10 year span. That's what I'm talking about. That's why this is difficult. And Michigan State is the only school with multiple final fours that went to a playoff game and it fell off badly after that playoff berth because Mark D'Antonio kind of started trying to recruit differently. Mm -hmm. He ultimately wasn't cut out for that. I don't think that's a coincidence that those numbers are what they are. I think it's a reminder that being good, being really good at both big revenue sports with overlapping seasons is probably more difficult than we give it credit for. Yes. I love I the fact that these are the specific stats you pulled is great. Cause I think that's exactly how um, it's exactly like kind of how I do it. There's one before I get to anything else. It's just a little factoid. One underrated one. I, I want to for your consideration, Cincinnati. Cincinnati's interesting because the Mick Cronin years, gosh, I'm getting into a lot of hoops today, aren't I? Um, the Mick Cronin years at Cincinnati were really, really promising. Mm-hmm. Look at all those trips that they made, though, to the top of the sport. Right. Few and far between. Very yeah. much a basketball identity. And then you know they had this basketball identity kind of sandwiched in between the Brian Kelly, Luke Fickle era, right? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of exactly yeah. when when all of that happened. So even at like to, the to Butch get Jones the era, time, the Butch Jones era, the oh, Butch, who's think? a good coach there? Great point. Okay. Great yeah. point. I it is a little bit more difficult when we were talking about Cincinnati's group of five level as long as we were. Yep. So that maybe takes away from some of it, but it's definitely one of those that would probably be up there if you're just looking at this over the course of the last two decades. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. What's so interesting about Cincinnati is they did a lot of their winning early. So a lot of these guys are like upstarts or like one coach programs, as they call them, which is what one of my good friends put me on. It's like, how many Blue Bloods are actually just one coach programs? And the one big out there, there was UConn because they had like their one coach and then they got Ollie where they won. And then they now have another coach. So Crazy. it's like, oh, wait, like, because in a way, and like Duke is kind of going through that too. Where it's like, yeah, they were solid, but they had Coach K. Well, now it looks like they might have the next Coach K. So now you're now you're actually this real dynasty. Because as as Kentucky fans, they will even turn their noses up at, at, at those kind of schools again. Okay, yeah, but you guys have been good for thirty or forty years. We've been good for a hundred and whatever years. You know, so basketball is so interesting because it's so is weird, right? Like it's actually harder to kind of get to the top in basketball because of what you're saying. Because the recruits, like all the criticisms that we have, and especially ones we're beginning to have about football. I've been true about basketball forever where it's like, Oh, you get this one little Cinderella and then you're just out of there. And it's really just Kentucky, you know, now Gonzaga's getting there. You know, that's another one. Like I was that one coach program. So yeah, I think, um, you know, I need to go talk to a, a Bama fan. That's even like a little bit older than Marler and see about like that 2004 era, you know, because that was when Bama football was kind of like, you know, in the dumps, like they weren't quite where they've been. And that was like, you know, the big final four run, all that different stuff. I do think we're in an interesting place, which is that did not matter if you hired actual Coach K at Alabama, like young Coach K, uh, you would never overshadow Nick Saban. Um, I, you know, I've been hearing from since like 2009 that Alabama is a basketball school. With the changes and Nick Saban no longer being there, this is the best chance they've ever had to be that, just to be honest with you, because you only have so much time as a student, right? Or as a uh, citizen of Alabama, you're going to talk about, you know, with Saban, you're going to talk about recruiting. You're going to talk about the rivalries. You're going to talk about all this different stuff. You're calling fine bomb talking about that stuff, right? Well, anything less than always being in every single playoff, except for like, you know, a couple here that were all special cases, right? Well, Nate Oates gets to a point where he is that. Now, what are we talking about? Right? Because if you had asked me three years ago, would LSU ever be a women's basketball school? I would have laughed in your face. Coaching now, they, changes that. Right. Yeah. Winning changes that. Coaching changes that. Exactly what you said. Natives might be that type of coach. And, and, and the, 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 the criticism on him has always been a little bit of a jump shooting team. So they was going to be a little bit more mercurial, right? In college, having that big man, you know, it's a little bit more important. That's why Duke always had similar, like late Coach K had similar stuff. But what they had Julia Local for. That was when they won their late title with him, right? And so that's the thing is that you're going to have 
some of these disappointing years, you know, like the Brandon Miller year with, with Nate Oates, that's how it's going to be, right? You can't achieve that level of consistency. I mean, if you put Alabama football, this is, you know, we're headed towards it. I want to make a joke, but if you put them in around the 64, there might be some years where they run into a team that gets them out early, but you, you never see that. You see the top four, right? So with basketball, there's going to be a lot more disappointment. It's just how March Madness works, that we're all rooting against you. And even the most successful coaches, again, look at Coach K, some of the losses they have are just like head scratchers. Like, wow, this is like the haters were so right about you. You're lost. You're da, da, da. But that one Julia Loca for you can turn it around. And so point being, I actually think Alabama is so uniquely positioned here um, in a way that even Auburn, I would say, isn't because Auburn – I think Auburn has made it like, and, and like I, I, Auburn fans are honestly my favorite fans in the SEC. I don't know if I ever like directly said that, but I love Auburn fans. Like I've never had an Auburn fan in my life that I really don't like when we start talking football. I, maybe I've only talked to the good ones. I don't know. I went to high school in Alabama, but it was, it was never the Auburn people giving me trouble. But I think that for Auburn, to your point, you know, without being a blue bud in football, and again, Auburn has done some really, really, really cool stuff in football. Some of the coolest college and NFL players ever went to Auburn, you know, like the Heisman's, the SEC championships, you know, not, not taken away from that, but they're like, it's just not exactly the same where you have the juice. That's what it is. You have the juice. Like Alabama, they've had the juice for, for 20 years, you know, Auburn has been shocking team here, almost, you know, five, four, like they've had this ability with Alabama. It's you wake up every day, the sun rises, you know, Nick Saban's about to whoop that butt on Saturday. And if it doesn't go that way, you're talking about it for months. That's not been the case with Auburn, even during the tougher years where they're going for the thumb, even during, you know, the Gus, the Gus years were anything but consistent, right? Like you, you know, whatever. With Saban, it was consistent, methodical, dominant. So you knew what to expect. It was impossible to break through that ceiling, right? So not talking about Nate Oates versus Bruce Pearl, talking about what Alabama has built over the last 20 years and how, I mean, anything short of being the greatest coach in history would be less than Nick Saban for DeBoer, right? So I'm not saying here, saying DeBoer is a fraud or anything. I'm just saying that that student populace has proven, okay, they can support a little bit of softball here and there. They can, you know, fill out Coleman Coliseum when it's really rocking, right? So how do you as an AD, you know, figure that out? So I'm fascinated by what Alabama's brand is going to be going forward. You know, we talked about these coaches that are kings and they're becoming less. I mean, when you think of Clemson, period, you think of Davos Sweeney. Sweeney, right? I always confuse that. What do you say, Swinney? What you yeah, say? that's, that's no. how it's spelled, right? Yeah, Swinney. Right, always, exactly. Always been Swinney, yeah. Right, uh, yeah, it's, that's one of those that gets me. But yeah, like when you think of Clemson, period, over the course of our lives, you think about Dabo. Alabama's kind of in the same with Saban. There's been some, you know, there's been your Colin Sexton's. You know, there's been these moments, right? You can have one-offs. You can have stars. Yep. If you're LSU, you can have a number one overall pick. Even yep. you know, the Shaq days and stuff like that. It, it's yep. not to say that you can't have teams like that. And that's a little bit what 2004 Alabama was. Yep. You know, like you, you can have the one-off. The biggest sign that you have ascended into that that top tier of, of brand and whatever your respective sport is, is mm-hmm. when there is a significant reaction when you are not good. Yep. What is the the conversation like? Is there indifference? Is there outrage? Is there outrage among the diehards and the casuals? Is there just outrage among the diehards? That to me is an has been such a fascinating thing to study in the ICC. That's different than what I grew up in in the Midwest, where there is not it's almost a little bit more like the Arkansas where it's like, Oh, Hey, like we really want to be good at all these different schools. Like, you know, Florida prides itself on obviously being an everything school. Auburn talks about wanting to be an everything school. NATO mm-hmm. talks about Alabama wanting to be a championship school. And he continues to talk about that. Even if he's in the post game, you know, press conference at the final four with a neck draped around his neck, he's talking about being a championship school and that dynamic that's there. But what is the conversation when you're not good? When Auburn basketball, yep. Yep. Is all of a sudden like if Auburn basketball endures a two three year stretch, where all of a sudden it's just man, it's 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 really rough. Do they have this Nebraska football like sellout? Do yep. they have that still? I'm 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 asking the question because yep. it hasn't that hasn't happened yet, and that's to Bruce Bruce Pearl's credit that that hasn't happened yet. I don't anticipate that happening. Yep. But what does that all of a sudden look like? That's how you know you have changed the perception of your program. Because it's a lot harder to change it nationally than it is internally. And if you can't even change it 
internally, you're not yep. changing it nationally. So that's what Alabama right now is in this very interesting place in, in that conversation of what is Alabama's basketball brand? Well, Alabama's basketball brand is Nate Oates. It, yep. it is Nate Oates. It is this unique style. It's development. It's scheme. It's portal guys. It's it's saying we're going to put up a million threes. We don't care who you are. We're not changing your style because you're Clemson and you've only allowed 14 made threes in the NCAA tournament. We're going to trust our guys. Even when we start one for 13 from beyond the arc, we believe in what we're doing. And you know what, to his credit, he has built that. And that take, that takes a lot of, a lot of conads in that spot to do that. It really does. But I haven't that, heard that one in a while. That's a good one. Yeah. Gonads. That's yeah. we got to really bring back gonads. Bring it back. Why did it go? But that's 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 what I think is 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 so interesting with these football focused schools of yep. the fan interest. When all of a sudden it's not there, and you endure those bad seasons. What's that like? Florida basketball. You knew Florida basketball changed with the Mike White conversation, right? Yep. When you looked at Mike White, if you would, if Mike White had done what he did in the pre Billy Donovan era, totally different conversation. Florida had like mm -hmm. five NCAA tournament appearances before Billy Donovan showed up, like ever, and. Mm -hmm. To like think about how the conversation with Mike White was a guy who would replace a legend. Well, he had two decades of the Billy Donovan standard and what he was trying to live up to. And we always talk about like, don't be the guy after the guy. But that yep. was to me the sign that Florida basketball had changed. And this conversation, this discourse, it was a discourse that at times felt a little bit Gus Malzahn ish at times of like, what he was being asked to do, was he good enough, this divide, this week-to-week, -week, is he the long-term guy, is he not the long-term guy? That's when you know your program cares. Yep. And that, to me, is not an easy thing to get. It takes a long time, man. It takes a lot of winning to be able to do that. Yeah, and I mean, I'm, I truly am not, like, you know, talking about you or, like, picking on you or whatever, but there's actually two great examples that we talk about all the time, and you just brought one of them up on here, and it's uh, Indiana basketball and Nebraska football. Yep. You know, there's two programs you've been around a ton, yep. right? And it's the fact we joke about, and just to re-explain this joke, if everybody's not been with us the whole time, you being in the Nebraska press box and guys like punching the table whenever they give up a five-yard run and you going, what, like, what, it's, you guys have like six wins. What are you doing? Like, Buddy, why are you, why are you watched, expecting this? I, I've watched this in Indiana. I Like, covering Indiana, I watched Wisconsin average like 25 yards a carry in games at Camp Randall where they scored 80 points against Indiana. Have you guys never seen a five-yard run before? Let me Literally. tell you. They do this all Literally. the time. And that's the difference, right? That's the difference. Because in basketball, I love how you've laid this out. It's like, yeah, you have your 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 Cinderella stories. And basketball is so much harder to determine because, yeah, if it's Nate Oates. Okay, so, you know, great example. You got three three teams here. Right? You got Tennessee, Alabama, Kentucky. They're all kind of fighting at the end, scrapping and clawed, right? Well, Kentucky, they bow out, you know, first. And it's the most disappointing, right? Now, when that happened, you know, in a way to Nate Oates, what has happened to Rick Barnes, it's not as big of a deal. But what happens to Calipari again, based on those expectations, we're all outside of his house ready to, like, you know, get a moving truck, right? Same deal, okay? Tennessee, never made a Final Four, right? So when they lose, it's not that big of a deal. It's something you've never done before. But Alabama changing that narrative, it's the team, you know, that, that you can say, oh, man, you have this great opportunity here, right? And so, so flipping that around, it's not about – championships, SEC championships, SEC tournament championships, even March Madness wins. It's exactly what you just said is are people punching the table when you give up five yard runs? Are Indiana fans furious, right? That they're hiring, you know, Woodson and doing all this stuff like, and they're only getting two five stars or whatever, you know, like, is that not good enough? Because your standard is your standard. And the worst thing to do is it's a version of us about Florida the other day, right? If you what is your standard? Determine that. For Indiana and Nebraska, they have determined their standards are at the top of the game. And when they don't meet that, they are disappointed. That's what buy-in is. It's hard to get. Mm -hmm. It really is. Tennessee's a unique case in that with basketball because I do think that the standard of Tennessee basketball under Rick Barnes, internally, there is so much more appreciation than there is nationally. And mm -hmm. I, I totally get it. And I would bring up the set all the time. Like from you know going into that Duke game last year, I remember being at that game – you know, covering that game here in Orlando in the round of 32. And I'm like, you guys realize that Rick Barnes hasn't beat a single digit seed in the NCAA tournament since 2008, like a single digit seed. And in the last two, two seasons, he beat three of them. And the job that he did with this team this year and mm -hmm. the appreciation that everybody grew to have of like, oh man, like, is this going to be the Tennessee team that breaks through and makes that first final four? 
the level of buy-in and care is absolutely there. And Tennessee mm -hmm. has not gotten to this place from a football standpoint since the start of the Rick Barnes era where it's like, oh, my God, football is the only thing that we can care about. Tennessee fans care about a lot more than just football. But obviously, if all things are equal, we know that outrage over Tennessee basketball is entirely different than outrage over Tennessee football. I remember outrage over Tennessee football is its own category. Like, that's the thing. It's like, he might be, this is a take out work shopping. What if Rick Barnes is like the Mark Stoops of, of basketball? Where it's like, okay, well, you are great in your role, right? But if we expect a championship, we're not going to get it. But the things you do beat punching up, beating these other teams, right? Because our focus is on us hiring Giotto or us getting out of the gutter and us hiring Hypo and us doing all that. And if football's good, Rick Barnes is Lanyap. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, <sighs> I think it's different. I think it's a different conversation because of where they're at in their career and what Rick Barnes was before he got to Tennessee. So it's, it's hard right. to kind of eliminate that from the conversation. Like Rick Barnes is going to be 70 this year. I mean, that's right. That's crazy. I remember I was at the last game of the Bruce Pearl era at Tennessee. It was mm -hmm. a first round NCAA tournament game against Michigan. And it was in Charlotte. I was on spring break with my buddies. We had like an all day ticket to the NCAA tournament that day. It was awesome. That rules. The lack of care that those Tennessee players had in that final game and the fan, it felt like fan indifference at that point to get smacked. And mind mm -hmm. you, they're a year removed from their first Elite Eight berth ever in program history, which Rick Barnes just gave Tennessee its second Elite Eight berth. But like the go, the how quickly it goes back to like when you're not that good. Like, ah, you know what? I guess whatever. We move the page. If Alabama, this Alabama team, to bring it all back to Alabama, to bring it all back to Nate Oates, if this mm -hmm. team had done what Nate Oates said it was, it was prone to do, which was not care about defense for 24 minutes of the game, if they had done that and gotten knocked out in the first round or if they had lost that wild game to Grand Canyon in the round of 32, Alabama fans immediately turned the page. Mm -hmm. immediately turn the page, go to spring football, go to Kalen DeBoer. Let's, what yep. does this look like? And, and yeah, obviously there are other things, you know, that they'll, that they'll pay attention to. Of course, I'm not denying that Alabama fans love their softball. I'm not doubting that, or I get it, but they're turning the page and they're like, mm -hmm. yeah, you know what? We have a coach that we really like, like it's, it's good that he's there, but you know what? We're, there isn't this outrage. And that's the difference. I think, whereas every year for Alabama football, that doesn't end with a national championship. You saw the reaction of those Alabama players on that field against Michigan. There's helmets yep. being slammed. There's what's wrong. Yep. This is the first time we haven't won. The, the standard is obviously so, so much different. But there wouldn't have been that outrage had this Alabama team bowed out early instead of making the run that it did. And yep. that's, I think, an important dynamic to remember. Yep, yep, yep. And just to say one more thing on the way out, you know, we've talked about you know, this officially well our villains conversation because it's how – Alabama can be, or like uh, Clemson could be a Cinderella story, right? In basketball, where in football, you hate their guts. You know, it, it's, it, they're different, very different. standards. That's yeah. all. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very different. Yeah. It would have been interesting to see, uh, to see that Clemson team um, be able to knock out Alabama. Like, what would, what would the conversation about Clemson basketball have looked like? It would be like, oh, Clemson, I joke. Tyler Clemson from Spartanburg, school. get him on the horn. <laughs> He needed to get it on the horn during down the stretch and tell PJ Hall to stop fouling in that game. Yeah, my God, that was uh, make a free throw, Clemson. Make a free throw for crying out loud! All right, great stuff, fun conversation. Hope people didn't mind too much that we talked a little bit of basketball. I think we brought enough actual insight to that. And weren't really shooting from the hip on a subject mm -hmm. that we don't talk about predominantly, but I think it's very, very relevant currently. Let's kick it to Michael Katz. Great insight into what's a, a pivotal season, of course, for Ole Miss. Talked a lot of Lane, a lot of Jackson Dart some portal stuff sprinkled in a little bit of Lincoln Riley there at the end. So here's Mike. I'm now excited to be joined by a very special guest. It is Michael Katz covering all things Ole Miss for the Daily Journal. Uh, Michael, let's start with something that uh, I talked about on the last show uh, that we had, but the, uh, I, I want to say comments that made the rounds. I don't want to say shade, but let's just call them comments that Princely Uman Mielin had calling out his former Florida staff and also talking about like the development that he's had at Ole Miss that he feels like he's getting so far. What was your reaction to hearing that? 
Uh, you know, it's it's funny because it was it was the first time we've gotten to to talk to Princely, and uh, you know, they're 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 coached up pretty well on on how to do things. But I mean, Princely's a, a really smart kid, and we're we're sitting there and like we're hearing it unfold, and then like the processors in my brain are like, wait, did he just say what I think he just said? And then like it, it, it happened again, and I was like, oh, okay, so this 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 isn't subtle, uh, but. You know, I, I uh, you know, I don't know when we're going to get to talk to him again. I think it might be uh, a few weeks before we get to talk to Princely. But, uh, you know, it, it's college football is weird now in that, like, <laughs> you've got guys going w in the same conference and they're going to play this year. And, like, you know, that's going to be something that's brought up uh, in November or October, whenever exactly the game is. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, but, you know, I, I think that. I think it probably came off poorly, and I know a lot of places picked up on that, and uh, it did come out, maybe not the best look, but I think what he is was really kind of trying to say was was more, maybe not so much like Florida is a disaster as it was like Pete Golding is really doing things for me that I didn't necessarily have before, and yeah, that's an indictment to an extent on Florida and their staff and, and what he feels they were able to do or weren't able to do for him. Um, you know, I think one of his, his points was that, uh, you know, there were times when he felt they just wanted him to be an athlete and use his athleticism. And there was no like game plan. Whereas, you know, Pete Golding has really sort of uh, pushed him and in, in to, to, to do different things that uh, he maybe uh, wasn't used to doing and, and to really have a game plan. And so, um, you know, again, it's 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 tough because I knew the second he said it, like I knew someone was it was going to get picked up, and I was like, oh man, like again, I I don't I, I'm I'm not I'm not siding with anyone here, but I, I think I understand, like I, I I get what he was trying to say. I just think it probably came out really really badly, um, but at the same time, uh, you know, I I think it was more of saying that he really feels like Ole Miss is the right place for him than it was. I think Florida is an absolute wreck. Now, don't get me wrong. He left Florida for a reason. I mean, he thought it was best for him. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I don't think necessarily it was uh, – he was trying to burn, burn the place down. Do you think it's too early to say, though, that Pete Golding has changed the defensive culture at Ole Miss? Do you get a sense of that at this point with him being a little over a year into this job? Without question. I think – you know, listen, I, I went to SC. Uh, Lane Kiffin was the head coach when I was a student at USC. All anybody has ever talked about with Lane Kiffin teams is the offense. It's it's the quarterback development. It's the receiver development. It's the running game. Um, this, you know, it started partway through last year. And now, I mean, really, it's the story of the offseason of how much they've beefed things up, uh, you know, particularly up front uh, defensively that, I think people realize that if Ole Miss is going to do the things that it thinks it can do, it's going to be because of the defense, because they finally have someone uh, who understands how this all works and has done it at the highest level. I know people have uh, thoughts on Pete Golding from his time at Alabama. Uh, I know Alabama fans have thoughts on Pete Golding and whatnot, but I don't think there's any way that you can look at what they did last year and say it wasn't a tremendous improvement um, from what it was. And just the way that they have been able to get players to buy in um, through the portal, um, through traditional recruiting of, of high school players to improve the talent level. Um, that's 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 a really big, you know, that, that's that, that's a lot of Pete Golding. I mean, Pete Golding has been known as a really good recruiter. And, you know, it's not like it just happened. Uh, you know, it, it, it happened pretty fast. I mean, you know, getting Centarian Perkins, uh, you know, on, on camp, he was one of his biggest recruiters when he was, you know, at Alabama and he got him to come to Ole Miss and, you know, those, those five-star top 20, 30 players, uh, they don't always end up choosing Ole Miss for defense. You are getting guys like Walter Nolan, um, who was, you know, a top two or three guy, uh, in, in his high school recruiting class, Prince of Ellen was one of the most highly sought after guys in the portal. You're getting these really high caliber defensive players who want to come to Ole Miss to play for peak Golding. Um, you know, it was never surprising when guys wanted to transfer to play for, uh, a Lane Kiffin team. If they were on offense, that made a lot of sense. You're going to put up numbers. Uh, but to do it on defense, I think says a lot about where the program's headed. Listen, I mean, this is a, this is a team that, 
should be in every conversation for this expanded playoff. And if it's going to happen, it's going to be because of what Pete Golding does. I think it's, it's really remarkable. Uh, you know, I've, this is my, I've covered three seasons here and really the shift I've, three seasons, three different defensive coordinators uh, since I've been here. And it's, you know, a lot of, a lot of different things, but uh, this is really the first time that it's felt like, uh, Ole Miss's identity isn't just everything that the, that the offense does, and I think that's a huge credit to Pete. Yeah, one of those guys that that came over and, and sought out the Ole Miss defense was Chris Paul Jr., a guy that you wrote about, you know, nicknamed Pooh, like Winnie the Pooh with the H. That's an important distinction to to yes, throw in yes, there. Yes. Uh, and, and you know, it's interesting that the common denominator that that he brought up, that Prince Uman Mielen brought up is the recruiting efforts of Jackson Dart and like even bonding over playing Fortnite and doing stuff like that. Princely talked about how that was unique. And, you know, I saw your quote that you had where he talked about how the quarterbacks that he had played with in the past, they're usually kind of off doing their own thing. They're friends with like a couple of different guys, but Jackson Dart has taken on this unique role. I mean, you, you followed, I, I imagine because of, you know, Dart's you know, start at USC, you followed him very closely, even dating back to his recruitment. And you've seen him at this point now, how much has he changed over the course of the last three years? It's pretty remarkable when you look at the very weird path that he has had because, you know, he's the National High School Player of the Year um, coming out of high school in Utah. He goes to SC. Um, you know, SC was really, you know, that was the year Clay Helton was fired, was, was, his, was his freshman year there. They were in an air raid. And he, 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 he was in a quarterback battle with Keaton Slovis, who I think actually finally just graduated. Uh, he's, he's been a few places since SC. Um, he was in a quarterback battle there. He didn't win it. You know, Slovis ended up being the guy because um, he, you know, was, he was the incumbent. He gets hurt. Dart comes in. Dart gets hurt. And it's kind of a back and forth thing between them all year. And, and Dart really showed some some really nice flashes. I think he threw for almost 500 yards uh, against Washington State. I think it was that freshman year. And, uh, you know, then Lincoln Riley comes and, you know, there's there's whispers about, well, if Lincoln Riley's coming, you know, who else is probably going to come is, is Caleb Williams. Uh, kind of the writings on the wall uh, at that point, if you're a quarterback at USC. Um, so he enters the portal and uh, you know, obviously I'm, I'm covering Ole Miss and I remember, I remember coming home from like, you know, Ole Miss games and being the sicko I am turning on ESPN and seeing like USC BYU and USC losing that game, of course, uh, at like midnight, but like there's Jackson Dart. I was like, oh, this kid's pretty good. Um, so obviously he ends up here and, um, he's had two years of quarterback battles, you know, the first year it's the Luke Altmeyer stuff. This past year, it was Spencer Sanders, who, uh, you know, was a four-year starter at Oklahoma State and was an all Big 12 guy. And you know, all Jackson has done is just stay true to his process and who he is. And he's just this really cool, calm customer that never gets too high and never gets too low, uh, regardless of what is happening um, around him. You know, Lane, Lane is hard on quarterbacks. Um, it, 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 you know, he... Early in Jackson's career, it wasn't always sunshine and rainbows. And there were some things that, you know, the turnovers were really, you know, a problem that first year for him. Um, it was a new offense. It was, you know, the transfer portal. It's really nice to get new players in, but it doesn't always gel right away, uh, especially when you're just coming off of Matt Corral and all the great things that he did. I think people were expecting it to just be like that immediately. And that's just not the way it worked. Um, not everybody was necessarily sold on him. And, uh, you know, they bring in Spencer Sanders and, you know, I, I, you know, you bring in, you know, you improve the depth in the room, but, you know, I don't think you bring in a guy like that if you're not expecting to at least create some semblance of competition because, you know, Jackson wasn't perfect that first year. If you can bring in a guy to push him, you do it. And all Jackson did was, was, was uh, like very obviously win that battle um, and got so much better from his first year here. Uh, he stopped turning the ball over. He was dynamic. Um, the team really took on his personality. I mean, the joke here is that, you know, everybody says Jackson needs the slide um, because he's going to get rocked like one of these days. But that's just not what Jackson does. Jackson is going to lower his shoulder um, and you're going to see, you know, his uh, his eye black smear because he is getting down in the dirt. Like, that's just who he is. He jokes that his mom tells him he needs to slide and he just said that's probably not going to happen. Um, and I think the team really picks up on that. I, you know, when you have a quarterback and Matt Corral was this way too, Matt Corral was a tough SOB. 
Um, when you have a quarterback who's willing to give everything he has, I think everybody respects that and everybody can sort of rally around that. And so, you know, with the transfer portal stuff this off season, uh, you know, it was really interesting to hear, you know, Princely, I think the way he put it, he was like, yeah, it was really, I don't want to say it was weird, but like Jackson Dart kept FaceTiming me. And I was like, that's actually like really interesting because you think of defensive players recruiting defenders and offensive players, you know, recruiting the rest of the offense. But here is the heart and soul of your team going out of his way to say, we need you. And I think that when defensive players hear that, you know, they understand what Jackson Dart is as a player, but when they can, when they see it, and they know it's sincere from a guy like Dart. And I know Dart's teammates will say the same thing. You know, you talk to any of the defensive players in the room, they love him because he puts it all out there. Um, I think that's something that people gravitate toward. Um, and so it's, you know, I, I never really thought of, you know, the quarterback as being, uh, you know, the guy who who unifies everything. I mean, you know, in a perfect world, yeah, but you know how football teams are. There's there's different groups. There's 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 so many different coaches and positional groupings and and clicks and all that kind of stuff. But when you have a quarterback who truly brings everyone together, uh, I think it's hard not to want to play for it. I mean, Lane Lane said something to the it was something to the extent of uh, he's never seen a player put like like help create a team more than Jackson did. And, and, you know, I know recruiting's changed and the transfer portal and all that stuff, but you know, Lane's been around some really, really good quarterbacks uh, in his time going back to SC and Alabama and uh, you know, with Matt and all that stuff. Um, you know, Lane doesn't just throw that sort of praise around. I, I think it's, it's pretty remarkable, not just what Jackson has gone through and the way that he has just kept true to himself, but I just think that people, um, with, within that locker room and, and people who are, you know, perspective, uh, perspective teammates, I think they just gravitate toward his, uh, his, his want to is just, it's, it's sincere, it's genuine. And I think, I think people really, uh, I think they gravitate toward that. I've got a lot of respect for him and I'll be honest. I think when we last talked, I was saying, you know, at Spencer Sanders, I think he's going to be the guy. I, I'm not really buying this belief that he's going to take this that Jackson Dart's going to take this step and all of a sudden look like 2021 Matt Corral because I hold that in such a high regard. I truly think it's one of the best SEC quarterback performances in a single season of the playoff era that we saw. And, you know, while I could do without the uh, the hit that he took against Georgia, like, you know, <laughs> the plays like that that are still there. Yeah. I, I, like, you're right. And you see all that and you see the recruiting stuff. And then people also see, you know, the, the big time NIL stuff. You're like, all right, well, this guy's getting taken care of and he's still this unselfish. Like internally, I think people people like that because you don't necessarily have to be in that spot. Have you pitched the idea to your editors yet of doing a story on Jackson Dart's private jet deal that he's got um, just so that you could, you know, do this for for research purposes and, you know, follow him around on it? Yeah, it's it's science, right? Uh, yeah. You know, if if he ever hypothetically wants to go to Los Angeles uh, when I'm planning a trip, that'd be really great, actually. Um, yeah, no, but it's you know it's crazy. Um, I remember when that whole thing happened, and he, I think again, like NIL era has been it's it's a small sample size, but when it's like he's like the first player to have a private jet deal, which like ten years ago would blow would just blows my mind. Like that's yeah. that's a thing. Um, but then, like, you realize it's Jackson and, like, you know that he's probably, like, going to be taking his teammates on hunting trips and, like, he's going to go visit home and he's going to he's going to take care of people. He's he's not one of those guys that's going to be, uh, you know, reckless with it because Jackson's just he's a really smart kid and he's really down to earth. And I think he understands that um, what he does right or wrong is a reflection of how people perceive the program. And he's done a really good job of of representing the program. And I mean, I don't think you could ask for a better ambassador right now. Do you think Lane senses that, that this is, this is such an important window an important juncture, not only, I mean, you can get into the legacy talk and all that stuff, but really about sensing the moment because everything that that's happened in the portal suggests that that sense of urgency is, is absolutely there with him. I mean, without question, I mean, this is a team that went 11 and two, they won the peach bowl. Um, and they, and they, they dominated that game. Uh, against Penn State it was not as close as the score I think it was still a 12 point game 12 13 point game and it was not that close um but the games they lost 
there was an obvious reason for it against Bama. Yeah, Jackson had a bad day. They got beat up up front. They were out talented and against Georgia. And that was, I think, really the moment. And Lane has talked about this. That I remember post game, we were sitting in the post game press conference, and um, he said, "You know, I love our players. We, you know, they they are great for us. But you know, basically, like sometimes you need to improve the talent, and you see." what Georgia has and you see what they have. It was a mismatch. And that's the reason that game happened the way it did. It's not the quarterbacks always. It's not the receivers. It's the guys up front, particularly defensively, because Georgia ran for like 300 yards um, in that game. I mean, it was, they got anything they wanted uh, in that game. And so I think when you see how good this team was, but that there's still, you know, if you want to be in that upper echelon, there's still a few things you got to do and you have the chance to do them. I mean, you got to do it. Um, you know, I, I talked to the head of Ole Mrs. Grove Collective. Um, it's their big NIL, and they've they've done a really uh, a, a really impressive job of of, of 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 getting funds together and 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 getting people on board with it. And one of the things he told me was that, you know, when the twenty twenty four expanded playoff was announced, that's when Ole Miss thought. It could be its moment because let's be honest, the odds of Ole Miss being um, in a top four may probably not great if you're playing the odds game, but they can be in the top 12 and they know that they, that they were there this year. They were there. They would have been in it, uh, you know, in 2021 Matt's last year. Um, they, they've been, there. they've been in that spot and you get into, a, you know, you get into a playoff situation, anything can happen, but I think it's, it's, it's realizing that, Everything is really suited for for what they are right now. And if they want to be serious about it, they got to bridge that gap between Georgia because eventually you're going to have to play those teams. You know, maybe it's not the first, you know, maybe it is the first round, whatever. And you're going to have to play Georgia again this year. Um, You know, it's a lot easier to get into that playoff uh, if you win that game. And I think that uh, Lane realized that, so much of this was getting better up front defensively and look at what they've done with, with Walter Nolan and, and Prince Simon the Ellen and, 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 you know, even a linebacker with, with Chris Paul jr. Uh, they saw what they needed and they did it. And I think they realized that when you've got a quarterback coming back um, who got everybody else to come back too. And I think that's another Testament to Jackson um, of getting Trey Harris to come back, of getting Watkins, of getting pre-scorn of getting all these guys to come back and defenders too to buy in and say like this is our last dance uh i think Ole Miss understood that you know you would probably have a good season if you just brought back the team as is it'd be fine but i don't think fine is really what they want out of this last this last season with all these guys if you bring those guys back you better do everything you can to improve the overall talent and and they've they've bought in i think they understand that this is a year that if there was ever a year to do it this is the one what's the mood if if it isn't the one if it if it isn't in this this talent that felt very much like a win now team if all of a sudden this is a little bit more of like oh man you go into post 2021 into 22 where it felt like, all right, you knew 22 was going to be a rebuild even after, you know, you make some of those big portal additions. But what's the mood like in Oxford if this team can't get to that 12-team playoff? I I mean, I, I think it's going to be – I think people are going to be disappointed. I mean, if, if, if this team, with everything it has coming back and the talent they've accumulated, uh, isn't able to do it, then, you know, like, you don't, you don't want to say which team can. Um, but, I mean, this is – this is a golden age of Ole Miss football right now. You know, you've had two 10, win, two 10 win regular seasons for, you know, for the first time ever. And you've had them in the last three years, the first 11 win season ever. Um, you are accumulating talent that, that Ole Miss doesn't always, isn't always able to do. Um, and so I think that, you know, listen, uh, and, and this, is, this is what we learned from the 2022 Ole Miss team, that you can add all of the transfer portal pieces, and on paper it looks really, really good, but it doesn't always work. It yep. doesn't always gel. That team was just never quite right, especially after, I guess, that Alabama – or that LSU game. I think that was their first loss, and it just they just never really rebounded from that setback. Um, last year – the pieces fit, and I think the quarterback probably helps that a lot. 
um, getting everything to gel. And so, um, you know, I, I expect it to gel again this year because, again, your most important pieces are guys that are coming back, and those are guys that have had success. And so, you know, again, when you've got a third-year starting quarterback, I think you feel pretty good about the chemistry. Um, but you do never know. You really you really never know how it's going to look. And, and that's the thing that players have been saying to us. And I know it's, you know, it, it's coach talk and it, it's a little, uh, uh, you know, it's coach speak. But, uh, you know, when they say we've got a good roster, but we don't have a good team yet, I, I think they understand that just because you have a lot of, you know, you've got five star guys and you've got all these these highly touted players, it, it doesn't mean it's going to work. And so. Um, you know, I, I think this team is going to be really, really good. I think their coaching is top notch. I think again, Pete Golding has, has, has upped the level, the potential of that defense and the players they've brought in. Um, they're going to be really, really good. And I know people have talked about the favorable schedule, uh, and whatnot. I don't know if I always, if I really believe in that because any team can lose on, you know, on the road in the SEC any week. Um, but yes, on paper, you know, you get Georgia and Oklahoma at home. Uh, you don't get Alabama. This year, you don't get Auburn, which are always, you know, very intense games. You get LSU, and that's on the road, um, which which I imagine is going to be tough. But, uh, you know, all things considered, it's, it's a pretty workable schedule. Um, yeah, I mean, I think people are going to be bummed if it doesn't work um, because, you know, listen, they might not say it out loud, but their actions tell the story that, that this is – they're not just doing all of this, like, for fun. Like, they are doing this because this is – this is the moment. And if it's not now, when is it going to be? It's a fair question. It really isn't one I find myself asking uh, a lot about, about Lane and about Ole Miss uh, as a whole. Um, speaking of coaches that are facing a very critical juncture uh, oh, yeah. ahead of kind of a new surrounding, um, let's just say surrounding factors facing them. Uh, how worried are you about Lincoln Riley in the Big Ten for you, your, your USC Trojans? Uh I actually, um, I'll give him credit because one, firing Alex Grinch seemed like the biggest no-brainer in the history of college sports, but it took several years, and I, I will never understand that one. That one will always probably fluster me, and probably Oklahoma fans, uh, until the day they die, uh, because that one never really made a ton of sense. I think he had like one good year, and it was okay. Um, and, you know, there's a part of me that is really bummed that Caleb Williams had those awful defenses. Uh, you know, I think they were like, they gave up like 30 points a game last year, which is just insane uh, to think about. Uh, Michael, don't add- worry. He's going to get better defenses with the Bears. It'll it'll be fine. Don't worry about that. <laughs> uh, um, but, you know, it's, uh, I, I do give Lincoln Riley credit that he realized that uh, this wasn't working. It, it wasn't. You wasted, no, I don't want to say waste. Waste is a tough term, but. You had one of the best quarterbacks, one of the best quarterback talents that college football has seen in, in a while. And he never made it to the playoff. He never even won the conference. Like that, I think when that happens, uh, you got to do some soul searching. And so Lincoln Riley went and hired not just like one defensive coordinator, but like 15 defensive coordinators. I don't know how the roles are working in terms of uh, – of titles and stuff, but they went and hired North Dakota state's head coach to be like a defensive coach, which is a crazy move. Um, though I understand he's probably getting more money as an assistant at SC than he was, uh, you know, the big 10 thing. It's, it's weird. Uh, the idea of Ohio state and Michigan, like playing them that I'm going to be honest. I don't think SC is ready for that right this second. Uh, not up front anyway, uh, you know, skill position fine, but, uh, as Ole Miss and Georgia taught us, that's not where it matters. It's it's up front, and uh, USC can't can't compete as currently constructed right now. But I think they're getting there, and I think the moves they made um, are, are are a step in the right direction. I don't know if it happens this year. Again, you've got a new quarterback, you got a new conference, you've got you know again a conference game in Piscataway, New Jersey is just again, blows my mind that, that that's going to be a thing that I have to think about. Um, but you know, at the same time, uh, I, I think it's, I don't, I don't know if I'd say SC is going to consider this like a rebuilding year. Uh, cause I don't think you can really think that way at USC. There's, there's a few schools where you just can't say that out loud. Right. Uh, SC is generally one of them. Um, but I think in two or three years, I think they're, they're going to be in a good spot. This is me, you know, praying every night and, and hoping, uh, just really, really hoping. 
uh, hoping that my karma is in a good place, uh, all those sorts of things. Okay, so we'll bring it back to Ole Miss. And I, I'll, this is a layup. I'll, I'll just give this to you. Um, but who makes the 12-team playoff first, Lane or Lincoln? Oh. Oh, I mean, that's, I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that's a, that's a, that's a Dwayne Wade, LeBron alley-oop and, and, and Dwayne Wade celebrating before he even sees the dunk happen. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, that's, it's Ole Miss. Ole Miss is, is in such a good spot right now. Um, and again, it is insane to think uh, that the head coach at Ole Miss was at USC uh, a decade ago when I was there. Uh, time is a flat circle. I've realized that uh, over the last few years. And coming to Oxford, Mississippi with Lane Kiffin and Jackson Dart has made that abundantly clear to me. But uh, Ole Miss, I, I think, is, 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 like you said, a layup uh, for that scenario. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. It's just crazy that we're, we're having this conversation going into year three for, for Lincoln Riley and, and where Ole Miss currently stands. It's a testament to, to both programs, really. Uh, great stuff. Uh, we'll, we'll do this again probably. Uh, we'll have to do it again sometime soon because Ole Miss, quite honestly, is just too interesting right now. Yeah, and, you know, let's be honest, uh, uh, you know, a certain head coach might say something that ruffles some feathers. Who knows? <laughs> well, or, maybe right. we'll be talking to, or maybe we'll be talking about the Bachelorette and one of his, uh, you know, one of the coaches on there. I mean, who knows? Always like, there's, there's, there's always something. You're exactly right. Appreciate it, man. We'll do it again soon. Thanks, man. Appreciate you. All right, we're doing Jersey stories. I, I talked about this a few weeks ago. Um, I want to be able to get as many of these as possible from you to kind of continue on the, the Jersey contest theme that we've been doing. By the way, by the time you're listening to this, voting will probably be wrapped up, but we have our semifinal rounds. Let's just say it's looking like, Will, you're going to have both of our uh, our championship participants. I'm not pleased about that. But what are you going to do? Maybe you you just got to get more jerseys. Look, just tell, just tell Lauren, look, next year you got to come back. We'll do it again. You can get 10 more jerseys. It'll be good get my off season reps and just get the most obscure jerseys that I can possibly find. Although I don't yep. know that those are the ones that, that well, the cross one didn't make it far. So I don't know. Yeah. Who knows, man, you could have strawberries on your shoulders and not even make a difference. Mm -hmm. So yeah, who knows what the people want? So this, this is what we're talking about. Jersey stories is I, I want sentimental Jersey stories, kind of like the ones that I feel like we've delivered um, for the last couple months here. If you have some of these stories, I want you to send them to me at or it's C O G A R A at SaturdayDownSouth.com. C O G A R A, SaturdayDownSouth.com. No apostrophe in that. I would love to be able to share some of these Jersey stories. My guy Emery sent me one that I wanted to be able to, to read today. So this is really good. Emery says, My dad and I didn't have the best relationship when I was a kid. Uh, it has since gotten better. But we used to go to a bunch of Braves games together. In 2007, he took me to a Sunday night home game against the Brewers. He told my mom that we would bring me back home, that he would bring me back home early. Well, Braves and Brewers had other ideas. Game was tied at two after seven, and we said one more inning. We continued to say that until Mark Teixeira hit a walk-off home run in the bottom of the eleventh inning. The ball landed three rows above us. On the way out, we sat in the line. We sat in line at the merch shop to get a red Chipper Jones jersey. He got it big enough that it's still big on me today. After I lost a ton of weight, at least sick brag. Uh, the jersey has stains a couple of spots where the thread is pulled and the numbers need to be restitched on the back. But I've worn that thing to every Braves game I've gone to since. That game was my favorite. I've been, uh, it was favorite I've ever been to, including playoff wins until, of course, October 30th, 2021, when I got to watch the Braves win a World Series game in my old, heavy, majestic Braves jersey that has seen better days. And he attached mm -hmm. the picture. Yep. Uh, confirmed. You can see some of the threads peeking out here. Definitely needs a restitch job uh, on the back of it. But those alternate jerseys, man, uh, I know I busted out a couple of the blue alternates that the Cubs would wear. Greg Maddox one as well. Uh, absolutely love them. Great stuff. I, that, that to me, like jerseys hold such a special place in people's lives. And sometimes I didn't even realize it until we shared them like on this, you know, by, by doing this. And that's why I want to do it these these last couple months. Um, so I'd love to be able to get some of these. Send, send me these stories. C-O-G-A-R-A -A at SaturdayDownSouth.com. Jersey stories. If we get enough of these, we'll kind of turn this into a little bit of a series. Or you know what? Maybe I'll just randomly bring them up at some point. Yeah. If I get a good one, I'm like, hey, let's bring up a Jersey story. Let's do that. That's I have absolutely no problem with that whatsoever. We'll take a break uh, in the action to be able to do that. Okay. Well, lad of the week. You're going with the last of the week. I can just tell. Yes. It's, yeah. you know, 
I've been really watching it on the women's tournament, um, not just because of LSU, but because, you know, um, our company we work for is investing a lot more in women's sports and I'm, you know, seeing the ratings and I'm seeing, you know, that's kind of like where it's going and I'm, I'm trying to be a student of that game as well. And, you know, in a week where the amount of controversy surrounding the women's game have been just insanely stupid. I mean, it's so stupid and disrespectful and, and honestly sexist. I mean, you're playing on a court with two different size three point lines. I mean, you, you saw that, right? That was so bad. How does I, I mean, how does that happen? How does that sexism happen? Sexism is how that happens. I'm just going to be honest with you, because if that happened to Calipari, you know what we were talking about? That would never happen to Calipari. The fact that they said, the coaches came out and said, you know, we're just going to play with this court messed up because this is our games on ABC and we want to grow the game. And ABC can't promise us that they would. We were, so we're just going to play with a busted court. I'm looking at ESPN and there's different uh, stat lines for the different distances. You know, we had one. Um, one woman on Notre Dame where she had her um her her piercing apparently pier- nose piercings are against the uh rules in the NCAA but they didn't ever enforce it on her so she gets to the tournament takes her nose piercing out starts bleeding she's like bleeding because like, she's been able to play with it the whole time NCAA looks at her goes you can't do that okay then we have this woman who is a referee who is refereeing Chattanooga and they find out she went to Chattanooga got her. Are we freaking serious? What well, thing is a mistake? What I would have liked, I would have liked to have been a ref for the Tennessee Purdue game. And as my unbiased opinion as an Indiana grad, I can promise you, I would have called more fouls on Zach Eady. I can mm-hmm. promise you that. Probably doesn't really go to the top of my resume to be a ref in that game. Yep, yep. And so I'll, I'll say it like this: you know, my my last of the week, you could pick a side here. It's going to be Flaw J. Johnson or Kim Mulkey, right? Now, again, I've told you before, I've not been a historic Kim Mulkey fan. I think her comments at Baylor were bad, or, you know, the way she handled the, the, uh, she's a, she's good for a good cringe. I'll say both LSU's, you know, two, two best teams have a coach that's, well, I guess baseball is technically better than football, but so let's give Jay Johnson some love. But yeah. Brian Kelly and Kim Mulkey might be the two most, oh, every time they talk coaches I've ever seen. I'm like, please just get away from that microphone. When she comes out and says she's going to sue the Washington Post, I'm like, what bodies does she have buried? Well, the Post story comes out. I read it, you know, it's not as unfair as she made it out to be. Um, but then the LA Times went ahead and, made a worse story than the one she described right yeah. and the way they described her the way they described these these women these i mean i hate to say girls because they're adults but no, they're younger than women. me yeah. you know but they're younger than me i mean these are young college age you know, you say college kids we're talking about football so i don't think it's disrespectful to say you know these, these guys are you know we got freshmen on the team we got people 18 to, you know 22 and obviously there are fewer like one and dones and women just because the way the rules are set up but yeah i just it to 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 to, to have all this sexism go on with the actual tournament itself in the NCAA, and even going back to the 2021 tournament, right? The weight, the, the weights, and, and the, the way that yep. that was set up was so yep. well. They couldn't even use March Madness. They couldn't even use that. It was trademarked, right. and it was only for the men's tournament. They only yes. could use that like a couple of years ago. I was people forget about that. Yes, no, 100. percent You know, and like I just want to say, you know. The way it's one thing to come after Kim Mulkey because number one, she's a grown woman, she makes lots of money, right? But she's done some things that deserve it. I like to call it straight, you know. I like to call it as I see it. That's one of the things I think I'm decent at. I was just telling you off the the air is that mostly it's LSU fans that are mad at me because I'm they expect me to be more of a homer than I am. But I'll say this: I've never been more of a Kim Mulkey fan than I have this week. And the way that Flaugé played, um, I mean, she's just the stories that should be coming out of this team, you know, with Angel Reese, with Flaugé, with the with the great role models they are. Everything they do gets spun into this negative, right? And you know, we're talking about you know there have been there have been real, real improprieties that we've seen in college football at large and in the SEC specifically, you know, and in basketball too. And we don't give those the same coverage that Kim Mulkey is getting. Now, why is that, right? And I, I put this I actually got picked up by SB Nation one of my tweets, but it was saying you know this LSU basketball team uh, has you know it upsets people because of both their conservative head coach and you know, it, it, well, let, me, let me like directly quote it. it it's um, it was like basically people virtue signal against their conservative head coach, and they're subject to casual racism against their players. So it's both ends of the spectrum are just bearing down this LSU team. And when you start to see Haley Van Lith come out and say, "I know why this is being said about our players. Some some of it's because they're women. A lot of it's because they're African Americans. 
And I think that at the end of the day, you know, when you see these five different ridiculous stories, we talk about the women's tournament be, being disrespected. When you see, you know, we spend the first part of this thing talking about Nate Oates, you know, got two guys that played for Nate Oates that are very least involved in some way in a murder. Okay. That's worse than anything Kim Olke's done. I'm just going to say it right now. Okay. And we celebrate these people and we should, we say that's off the court. That doesn't matter. So why are we looking and digging to find ways to dump on these LSU players, to call Angel Reese, you know, classless, to call them dirty debutantes. I mean, that is one of the most disgusting things I've ever seen. I can't I've imagine writing that, Well, I can't imagine. I can't. I, the get to her editor, like uh, one of the, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on her name from Shutdown Fullcast. She said, um, some a lot about once a day, you probably relate to this, but once a day, I see something that says, who edited this or who, who edited you? She said, this one made me think, who raised you? It's like the way that you're going out there talking about younger people. Again, these writers are older, right? They're 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 talking about kids that are 18 to 22. You know, and some of them have long storied careers. Some of them are headed to the WNBA, but Flage isn't. You know, she's still in school. She's still an underclassman. You know, so the fact that Flage was able to put her team on her back. I want to talk about what's between the lines. I want to talk about what this LSU team has accomplished. She was awesome. She yes. was incredible in that game, man. Like you turn that on. Mm-hmm. Like if you're one of those people that's like, ooh, this is close. I'm going to turn on the UCLA game. Not because UCLA is milk and cookies. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Oh, uh, I, it, but it if you bears t- repeating, because it's ridiculous. If I made that up, you wouldn't believe it. You know? No, I, I wouldn't. That that she was unbelievable. Like she mm-hmm. like the, some of the plays that, that she makes, you're just like, this is this is someone who like should be playing at the next level, probably. But like I, I kept thinking about it afterwards, and like I would look. I've I've not been shy about my frustration with Kim Mulkey. Right. I still th- I still think that Tom Fernelli had like the best tweet related to it. Like the Kim Mulkey Washington Post story wasn't a heat piece. It wasn't a hit piece as much as it was a profile that did a pretty good job of explaining why Mulkey defaults to thinking it would be a hit piece. Like that mm-hmm. was I thought that was mm-hmm. that was kind of funny. If we just had Flage get up there and freestyle instead of Kim Mulkey at press conferences. I think that'd probably be a win for everybody. Is, yeah. Who says no? Yeah. Kim Mulkey probably is fine with that. She doesn't want to get up there and talk to the media anyways. Who cares? Yeah. And we can't, you know, like you said, you know, the game is tonight recording this before just to keep it a yeah. buck. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So LSU, you know, you know, you never know. They could win by 30, they lose by 30. But this isn't about, I said, let's keep it between the lines. Well, because other people have taken outside the lines, like yeah. I think it was Phil Jackson that said if it, uh, if the controversy happens in the public, we settle it in the public. Same deal here. Let's talk about what these women have done. Let's talk about how, uh, you know, Kim Mulkey is just as accomplished as Don Staley on the court. Let's talk about what Angel Reese has done, bringing a championship to Louisiana. Let's talk about Flaugé. Not just she's the coolest looking women's basketball player I've ever seen. Watching her play looks like watching an old school guard in the NBA. I've never seen a women's player look like that. Caitlin Clark's fun, but it's a lot more of a Steph Curry. Steph Curry. Flaugé puts you in the dirt when she scores on you. It looks awesome. So let's celebrate the on the court and the personalities of this team and specifically the players because you can have your pins of Kim Mulkey. I get it. These players have done nothing wrong. Yeah, been a fun tournament. Been a really fun mm-hmm. tournament. I turned on that game, uh, South Carolina. I was pretty much start to finish. Oh, with with the exception of South Carolina, Indiana, with the exception of like we went on a 15 minute walk, and that was when Indiana like went on their comeback. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh my god, like I can't believe this is a five point game, something like that. Uh, but that was that was a really fun game to to be able to watch. Yeah, it's been been an incredible tournament so far, and obviously people will know the result by the time that this is out, but. Still, nonetheless, um, LSU has brought a whole lot of eyeballs to the sport that I guarantee you were not there for for a variety of reasons. Okay, let's talk about the men. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, but Kevin Keats is my lad of the week. Well, uh, the NC State coach. What else can be said about NC State and and what mm-hmm. has been going on? It, it's one of the wildest things that the history of this wild tournament has ever seen. Nine straight wins. After it had lost seven of nine games entering the ACC tournament, it needed to win all five of those games just to reach the NCAA tournament. Even the fact that they they played that round one game on Thursday was kind of overlooked after what they had mm-hmm. to do to get through the ACC tournament. It feels like 83 all over again. There's even the parallels of like Zach Eady being like the Ralph Sampson, or I guess maybe in this case, he would have had to have been a player on Duke. I don't really think Filipowski fits the Ralph Sampson, but you get what I'm saying. The NC State team that that – won it all in 83 like it, it's it's pretty hard to fathom that there could ever be something that that competes that but mm-hmm. Keats has gone from being a guy on the hot seat to being possibly if we were doing voting for national coach of the year like would he win it if they were decided after the NCAA tournament I mean yeah. it's just it, it's crazy like Lauren and I watched survive in advance the 30 for 30 on 1983 NC State Jim Valvano and 
I had probably seen it like two or three times. Lauren had never seen it before. So I was just mansplaining how that 83 run is held up four decades later and how basically we've never quite seen anything in the NCAA tournament, what, what they did endure before it, during it, all those things. And so while we're watching this current NC State team play, we're like, man, this year's team, it's one up in that, it's doing all those things. We had the Duke game on in the background, and it was just, it's not even like miracle stuff. It's just, it's unbelievable. Kevin Keats, this is America's team, especially if you don't mm-hmm. want to root for Zach Eady to shoot a million free throws. Yeah. Facts. We need Connor O'Gara riff in that one. it would be closer <laughs> to reality. <laughs> if DJ Burns falls out of this game, oh my God. But, but hell hath no fury. <laughs> yep. Man, we we cannot have that. Absolutely cannot have that in this game. All right. Great pod, Will. That was fun. A lot of basketball talk. No problem whatsoever with that. If you haven't, leave us a five-star review. Subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can watch every episode of the Saturday Down South podcast. Follow us on Twitter at the SDS pod, at Sat Down South, at CJ O'Gara, at Go So Hard. Thanks, guys. Talk soon.